Well, today, when we were thinking about um, this symposium, I think one of the things that Stephanie and Lenore and I talked about was who are who are modern day SARGs? Who are people that are working in the realm of creativity um, like Tony Sarg? And so I started putting a list, my wish list together. And it's pretty incredible because that wish list is with us today. Um, and it, it's actually interesting because on that wish list was also Lewis Henry Mitchell, who I have had the pleasure through Stephanie um, has become a friend of mine and it is also just a, a creative genius. So having him just speak, I think was a great transition for this panel. Um, so it's I'm in awe um, of the folks that you're gonna hear from today because they are also inspirational to me in, in lots of different ways. Um, I think uh, for today's purposes, I think I'm gonna introduce each of our guests right before they speak. Um, so our first um, speaker is Carl Sprague. Um, and Carl is an acclaimed um, production designer, art director, illustrator uh, for film and stage. He's also a Sarg fan and a, a puppeteer. Um, in fact, I've had a chance to visit Carl at his home and he's gonna talk to you a little bit about um, the the puppet theater that he actually has in his, his backyard. Um, but his career highlights include working on Wes Anderson's The Grand Budapest Hotel, The Royal Tannenbaums, The French Dispatch, Dispatch, as well as he worked on films La La Land, 12 Years a Slave, Amistad, and others. Um, and um, we were fortunate enough that um, Carl also designed um, kind of these proscenium frames around the marionette, the, the, uh, some of the Sarg and other marionettes in, in the exhibition. And so thank you, Carl, for doing that. Um, so with that, Carl, I'm going to pull up your slides. I learned a lot about the uh, about the balloons. <laughs> boy, oh boy. I'm glad to hear. I'm glad to see that they did them in Akron. For goodness sake, over at the uh, in the uh, in the Goodyear blimp hangar. Um, well, so now I've got a bunch of pictures here. Uh, I don't know, some little bit random, but uh, the. Uh, 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 I inherited this theater um, from my, uh, there it is sort of sitting underneath the tree, um, from my um, my grandmother, uh, and it was her father who, who put it together back 100 years ago, uh, and, and that was my first exposure to uh, uh, putting on a show really was, you know, I was eight years old and here were these magical marionettes and, uh, 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 and they came with all kinds of like scenery and, and, and it is something that I think is like very, uh, uh, directly related to, uh, to Sarg. Um, why don't we just keep on scrolling through here? There you go. I built this little building. So that's the puppet theater, and that's the inside of it. A um, bit of a mess, but uh, and here is sort of the cast of characters these days. Uh, so we've got like I don't know seventy five puppets. Uh, so you know we can kind of do anything. Um, and uh, if I don't talk too long, maybe we'll uh, wrap up with a little bit of thing. Um, anyway. Um, you know, unfortunately, puppetry does not pay. Um, so I uh, ended up um, going into film business. Um, I've done a million things um, over the course of the last, good God, what is it, 40 years or something? Uh, and, um, you know, these are, these are, these are some bits from uh, um, my first, you know, big feature break, uh, which was, uh, um as an assistant art director on great yeah on uh on Scorsese's Age of Innocence um and you know um uh that was amazing um yeah no we were shooting up in Troy New York uh 
and all over the place, mostly in 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 down in New York City, but uh, but we did we did a lot of stuff upstate here, uh, and um, and I got like I don't know, um, we weren't a big department. There was uh, I somehow I managed to get delegated to uh, to draw up the ballroom, which uh, was really like being thrown off into the deep end of the pool. <laughs> uh but uh anyway it was a fabulous set um and this is another thing addicted to love gigantic couple million dollars set we were doing with like two parts of um of 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 uh, two sides of a uh, new york uh, uh city street uh matthew broderick and meg ryan what's next um, Carl, could you just, for those that might not know, could you explain in terms of your role as a, either an art director or production designer, like what that means for a film? Um, well, uh, you know, the designer is the loftier title. Uh, William Cameron Menzies inv invented it for himself after uh, Gone with the Wind because he didn't feel like... Uh, Art director was sufficiently grand to describe his participation in that project. Um, uh, so now everyone's a production designer. I mean, you know, uh, and art directors become kind of a second banana position. But uh, you know, I kind of bounce around from one thing and to another. Um, you know, obviously, it's nice to be the designer, and you know, you get to you know, you know, figure out with the director and so forth, like what color it's going to be and what the sets are going to look like um uh, uh but uh you know um oh this is amistad um and uh lots of dirt on the street and uh more amistad yeah we had so much oh god we're shooting in the state house oh this is a low budget thing uh i did uh called disappearances up in vermont i think all this street burned down up in st johnsbury so I'm glad we photographed it while we did. I even found the train, an honest to God steam engine. Uh, and, uh, you know, then I've been, like I said, bouncing around. I mean, so I've been doing a lot of, you know, with West projects. Uh, uh, um, I worked with a couple of designers, David Wasco, initially on Tenenbaums, and then since then with uh, Adam Stockhausen. Now this is kind of characteristic. This is a little set for uh, um, uh, Moonrise Kingdom. Keep on going. So that's my sketch of like what I thought the set would look like. And next slide, that's what Wes wanted. <laughs> he likes he likes symmetry. Anyway, so I draw stuff, you know, um, sketches and 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 construction drawings and you know just try and get into the detail of scale and get stuff uh to the point where it can get built and um you know a lot of this is oh this is from 12 years a slave those were wonderfully fun illustrations to do uh the um you know the interesting thing about that i mean this film is set in the 1830s so there's no there's no photographic reference. There's just like, you know, steel engravings and stuff. So we were kind of having to make it up. Uh, mm. But uh it was it was it was it was delightful. And um I uh I think they just did a piece about it, like, you know, it's 10 years later now, uh uh in the Times, and it made it to sound like, you know, I mean, I mean, you know, it's like everyone else was like at out there dying of heat stroke in the fields in uh in in louisiana in the summertime i was in the office drinking coffee and making pretty pictures it was the great it was the greatest job carl can i um i just want to interrupt you and ask how much dialogue you know if you have a director how much dialogue happens between you and the director um, before you start sketching um, a vision, a, a visual vision for the production versus the director says, come to me with ideas. Like, how does that negotiate? Uh, 
I don't know. I mean, I think, uh, you know, I mean, um, it depends on the, on the, on the director, frankly. Um, uh, you know, sometimes directors have very specific ideas in mind and, um, and will even yeah, put together their own lookbooks and research. Um, you know, Wes has like pretty much cooked, uh, his projects from storyboards and little animatics, he calls them, um, uh, you know, to the point where, you know, the whole movie exists. So oh, here we go, Grand Budapest Hotel, my big claim to fame. Um, and, uh, um, and then we built this lovely model. Uh, I mean, we, that was actually Simon Weiser and his incredible team in Berlin. But, um, more Grand Budapest. Uh, oh, that was a fun scene. Oh, this is um, this is from a puppet show of sorts. This is Isle of Dogs, uh, the big cityscape, which uh, was um, oh, that oh my God, that drawing took me a week, <laughs> at least. Um, and so yeah, and then they then they came and actually used in the film they like went back and they did all kinds of photoshop and stuff on top of it and um and i think it kind of like i don't know whatever got a little overworked more more isla dogs Ooh, the pagoda slide i think it made it into the movie we certainly talked about it oh these are pictures from la la land i did um while i was working on um on uh, isle of dogs uh, I was in a weird situation where I was, you know, basically parked in an office in New York and, uh, at the end of the day, um, I'd be done with my work for, 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 for Wes. And then, uh, my friend David Wasco called up and said, you know, Carl, we really need someone to like, you know, give us some concept ideas for, uh, this La La Land movie. I'd actually met Damien Chazelle before, uh, he um uh i kind of know his grandparents <laughs> so um uh, anyway so these were like super quick sketches like just i mean seriously i mean i can't tell you how little time i put into them but uh um uh, but they had kind of the feel of the thing and um and i don't know it seems somehow like they liked it and uh and uh i uh and you know um david wasco and his wife sandy uh um won an oscar and i do other things a lot of ballet um which is always about the christmas tree and these are theatrical backdrops and stuff so that um more of that more theater uh incredibly low budget this is an errol morris thing we were interviewing steve bannon if you please um and uh but you know i mean i get you know i mean i go from like a sketch to some of the technical stuff oh these were funny illustrations for something called isn't it romantic um uh and uh those were fun to do uh kind of like you know again like giving them an idea of the feeling is that is that the end of the deck that's the end of the deck so our second speaker, I have to tell you, um, I am really in awe that he's participating. Um, Ronnie Burkett has been captivated by puppetry since the age of seven and began touring his shows around Alberta at the age of 14. Um, his Ronnie Burkett Theater of Marionettes was formed in 1986 and continuously playing on Canada's major stage and as a guest company on numerous tours abroad. Uh, Ronnie received um, many accolades, um, the Herbert Whitaker Drama Bench Award for Outstanding Contribution to Canadian Theater, a Village Voice Obie Award, and four citations of excellence from Unima USA. In 2019, Ronnie was appointed as an officer of the Order of Canada. Um, I have seen, uh, Ronnie is going to talk about this, his Daisy Theater. I've seen it numerous times. And Ronnie really in, embodies Tony Sarg because not only is he an incredible, well, probably 
one of the most talented puppeteers on the planet. Um, but his designs and his craftsmanship, his uh, ability to be a showman on stage and understand word and storytelling and comedy is truly unmatched. And um, so, Ronnie, it is an honor for you to be here and for people to hear about your incredible career. Thanks, Darren. I'm so thrilled because my first puppet crush was Tony Sarg. <laughs> And I discovered puppetry in the World Book Encyclopedia at, at the age of seven, and it mentioned Sarg, of course, and there was a picture of Bill and Cora Baird surrounded by all their puppets, and that became a lifelong stalking of Baird. Uh -huh. and, and, you know, I'll just tell this part of the story at the beginning. Um, I wrote Bill Baird when I was seven, and then I wrote him when I was 10 and said, I, I can actually leave my family and move to New York, so let me know. And nothing. I wrote him again when I was 14 and said, no, seriously, I'm a grown adult and I can and I'm working now. I'm touring so I can come and work for you and leave my family. Nothing. Uh, I ran into Bill at the UNAMA International Congress in Moscow. I quit university, got a job, went to Moscow for this puppet Congress when I was 18. And I met Bill there and he said, oh, are you stopping in New York on the way home? And I said, actually, I have three days in New York. And he said, well, come to the theater. And he auditioned me and hired me on my 19th birthday. So it's such a thrill to be part of this Sarg conversation because I, you know, we're such isolationist puppeteers. We spend all our time building all this crap and touring alone. And, and so we invent family trees. And so because Tony Sarg begat Bill Baird and Bill Baird begat me, I feel that I have a lineage back to my grandpa Tony Sark. <laughs> wow. Here is this first slide is me when I was 16. And because I uh, lived in a rather remote city in Western Canada, I would write fan letters. And I conned the library into doing a puppet exhibition. And the deal was if I could get people to send puppets, the library would pay all the postage to and from. So this is me surrounded by puppets I had conned from a number of working puppeteers from Detroit, from Ohio, from Toronto, from Vancouver, all over the place. And it was just a way for me to get the puppets in my hands and look at them, <laughs> really did a display. So we can go to the next one. Um, and of course, like everyone of my generation, Muppets exploded right when I was a young adult and in New York. So. I was the last person Bill Baird hired at his Greenwich Village Theater. It closed the season I was there. So I got in right under the wire as a company member. And my next job was actually with Bonnie Erickson, who had started her own company. She had designed Miss Piggy and Statler and Waldorf for Muppets. And she started her own company. And I got to go be the lowest member of the team working on, I think, the Philly Fanatic Shoes was my job. And so when I went back to Canada, of course, I had all those um, influences for television puppetry. So here I was in my early 20s, surrounded by foam and fleece characters. And I thought, this is what I'm going to do uh, forever. But I was always um, fascinated mostly with marionettes. And this is a, 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 a blueprint that my main mentor, Martin Stevens, had devised for, I think, Cleopatra in 1940. And uh, so I understood this style of construction because I took his correspondence course when I was 12 years old. And as goofy as that sounds, it became the basis of everything I know about playwriting, about vocal technique, about building. Um, even writing a contract was in there. So... This was what I always wanted to do, but when I was younger, surrounded by all the foam and fleece, everybody would say, well, no one does marionettes anymore. Um, and I was working in New York when Don Celine had passed away, who was the head designer at Muppets. And I ran into an old puppeteer who um, uh, was talking to me about that. And he said, Don had been sneaking into the shop late at night to build marionettes because he... Don Celine had been mentored by Martin Stevens, who designed the puppet on the screen. So again, I felt this sort of DNA connection through puppetry with Don Celine. And that 
encouraged me to go back to Canada. I left New York and I went to Western Canada and a bunch of theater people said to me, what do you want to do? And I said, I want to do a one man marionette show for adults. And they went, cool. So it was the complete opposite of the New York scene where everybody said, no one does marionettes anymore. Don't do that. So in a weird way, going back home was what really kickstarted my work. This was the very first marionette I ever made uh, in Martin's. Martin Stevens studio. Um, I'd never carved a hand before and he was watching TV. So he said, give me one, you take the other. And I sat beside him watching TV and mimicked him carving a hand. And so this was the very first marionette I made. My first show was a genre show. It was called Fool's Edge. And it was a, a Commedia dell'arte musical for adults. It was very body. And this was the main cast. Uh, you can see Pantalone and Isabella and Colombina and uh, Petruchio there. So uh, this was the very first marionette show I did. And because it was the 1980s, uh, I was a club kid. So the next slide, I think, was the poster image for the show. And I remembered Sarg and... Um, Margot Rose had actually said, if you're going to start a company, put your name on it. Don't come up with a cutesy puppet name. You know, so it became Ronnie Burke at Theater of Marionettes. I guess we now call it branding. But this was the poster image that went all over Canada on my tour. So it kind of said this is not Hansel and Gretel for five-year-olds. Um, and I'm so glad I was that cheeky young man once. The next show was another genre show called The Punch Club, which was a touring Punch and Judy hand puppet show. So there was a hand puppet stage above, you can see. And then it all opened up to be the backstage where the players of the Punch and Judy troupe were seen in their dressing gowns as marionettes. This was the next genre show, which was a gothic murder mystery set on the Scottish moors. And... Uh, I call this the puppet show that ate my life. The set was enormous. It took up, you know, basically a real theater stage. There were 42 marionettes in this one man show. It was very ambitious. And we have, um, and there was the poster image for that show, Awful Manners. Um, again, bad boy of puppetry, branding himself. There you go. Um, I had mentioned that I had been doing genre shows. I was doing cheeky musicals. Uh, the puppets actually looked like puppets. They kind of had a bared proportion, a bigger head, you know, that cartoon body. Um, and one day I was slipping through Baird's book, which I'd had my whole life. And I'd read it back to cover many times, but there was a section that really jumped out to me about Czech puppeteers doing underground shows during the Nazi occupation. And these shows were beacons of light and became known as daisies because apparently a daisy grows in the dark. And that changed my whole life because the political scene in Western Canada was getting very, very, very right wing. AIDS was exploding everywhere. And um, suddenly, I became politicized and I didn't want to do genre musicals anymore. I wanted to do something serious. So this is the set for Tinka's New Dress, uh, which was um, about a government called the Common Good and a, a puppeteer and his sister going underground to do Daisy theater shows. And the reason the set was a carousel was, A, the entire cast was on stage and it would rotate and I could pick the puppets off for the scene, put them back, it would rotate to the next scene. But my hero of the Czech movement was Josef Skupa. And uh, Professor Skupa, one of his plays that passed the Nazi censors was called Carousel on Three Floors. So that was a little homage to Skupa by doing a carousel. Um, this is from 10 Days on Earth. Um, and things you shouldn't do with puppets, I do. You're not supposed to walk them up and down stairs. You're not supposed to sit them in a chair and have them talk for 20 minutes. Um, this is a beautiful little set. I think I just put it in because the set's so nice. But, you know, it's funny. I was uh, refreshing my Sarg memory yesterday. And when Sarg started, you know, he invited Ellen Van Volkenberg from the Chicago Little Theater to come and work with him as the director and Hedy Louise Mick as the uh, playwright. 
And I think, you know, I think they were at odds because Ellen Van Volkenberg wanted puppetry to be theater and that the puppets had to do something that was authentic in terms of text and storytelling. And Sartre was a great showman and he wanted to put every trick in the book in. So, you know, um, narrative be damned, let's have a juggler come in and let's have this character come apart. And, and so they were kind of at odds. And, and so in my career, I've tried to incorporate, um, I guess, tricks, you know, because there's so many great cabaret puppeteers in the world. And I've learned some of the tricks, like how to make a stripper puppet, how to do that. But more and more, I was trying to incorporate those devices in the dramatic narrative. And so in this show, this woman crosses the stage, peers in on her son's bedroom, crosses back, there's just a clock ticking. And before she goes off, takes off her slippers, just slips her feet out of them. And you could hear the audience gasp because they didn't know how it was being done. And then she goes and dies in her room, but the slippers are there through the whole piece. Um, so that's how I like to incorporate tricks. Um, in that same show, her son, who's intellectually challenged, uh, adult, uh, when he gets stressed, reverts to his favorite childhood book, Honey Dog and Little Burp. And so we see scenes in his mind played out with the characters of Honey Dog, Little Burp. That's Blanche Dubas, the sheep that they find. And so we had a continuous cranky roll of painted scenery like a storybook. And so we went from this very dark wood house into this fairy tale. Um, and, you know, I got to say, because of all the old puppet books, because of all the influence of Sarg and the Roses and Bill Baird, I love painted scenery. I don't know. I'm just... I. I I can't get enough of it. And I don't use enough of it, actually. Oh, this is another shot from Tinka's new dress. Um, and we had these stuffed figures you can see in the frame behind them. So we had seven stuffed muslin neutral figures that got repositioned throughout the show. One would be a guard. One would be an authority. We had a mother and a child. And they start disappearing through the course of the play. And every scene had a a very specific color palette. So this was the ball, the gold scene. And I just threw that in because that's such a good costume. Oh, I've worked with the same costume builder for 36 years. Her name is Kim Crosley. She's a cutter at the Stratford Festival of Canada. That's her day job. But we have uh, worked together nonstop for over three decades. And we have a real great vocabulary with one another and she is i think the finest puppet costumer on the planet and that's the final scene from tinka's new dress where we go to black and uh tinka's pregnant there in the camps and so we invented our own little symbol too this is a, this is the only um show for young audiences that i've done with theater of marionettes and it was called old friends it was a nonverbal show um, which, Darren, you can imagine, it was a real challenge for me to shut up. But it was a show about senior citizens coming in and out of a park. I wanted to show two marginalized age groups one another. So children were meeting old people of all different kinds. This was my favorite character from the show, Marjorie. Uh, Street of Blood. Uh, this is the beginning of Edna Rural, who is in the Daisy Theater. Um, uh, Edna Rural is the one in the chair. She's a little farm lady. She pricks her finger, bleeds onto her quilting, and sees the face of Christ. So it's the Shroud of Turnip Corners, and then Jesus appears and a vampire troupe doing a musical. And it was a it was a huge success for me because it was talking about AIDS, and it was done with puppets. This gives an idea of playing with different scales on Fool's Edge, the first show, I was on the same level as the puppets. Uh, so they were short strung. Um, and I've gone up and down. So in Street of Blood, I was quite high up. So you can see the prairie grain elevators behind me. But Edna's, uh, there were three sections like Edna's sitting in that would fold down and we'd be in the environment and then it would fold up and it was sheet metal covered up on, on the front. Uh, the beginnings of a character who is one of the most popular, Esme Mazengill, who in this incarnation was a vampire actress um, traveling. And this show was called Happy, and it was about grief, actually, and it was set in a rooming house. And the set was all um, 
whitewashed pine. And so what I did is, and, and then the lighting designer was able to color it for me and did beautiful lighting design. But I realized since we were using a very light set, I was going to use white strings, which uh, which I have a ton of white fish line left if anyone needs it. <laughs> <laughs> this is another scene from Happy, one of my favorite characters. And again, cabinet doors would open up. Uh, he was at a a party scene and the door opened up and there was a little chandelier in there. So I, I, I like things opening and revealing a lot. And that's the final image where these whitewashed screens at the back that have taken on all different uh, textures and gobos and colors becomes this rainbow and the cabinets are open. This entire cabinet section though revolved and there was a little marionette stage on the other side of it. This is a show called Provenance, uh, set in Vienna in a brothel. Um, I was able to go to Vienna and do some research and it kind of went, got drunk on Art Nouveau. So <laughs> that's what happened. And the play centers around this painting of a naked boy tied to a tree, a sort of a take on Lita and the Swan. And this is the main character, the brothel madam, Lita, in front of this painting. This is uh, from Billy Twinkle, which was set on a cruise ship. And again, it's a story of a puppeteer. So we had puppets operating little puppets, but not as a trick as part of the narrative. This is the set for Billy Twinkle, which was all uh, never designed a curved touring set ever, but <laughs> I did, I did. Um, another scene from Billy Twinkle, you can see the small marionettes in their hands. Ronnie, what what scale are like how how many inches tall are, the, are is the main marionette versus the miniature? Um, I work in an odd scale. I mean the and it was set by Sarg actually, which is not or the North American standard scale is four inches equals a foot. So a six foot tall man would be twenty four inches. And Sarg had started with much smaller, and then he went much bigger. He went from eighteen inches to three feet, and then settled on the twenty four inch scale or the four inch. Uh, that was just a little small for the sort of venues I play. So I do five inches equals a foot, which makes no sense. So a six foot tall man puppet would be 30 inches. So I think the miniatures were probably six or seven inches tall, I think. Oh. This is a show called Penny Plain that uh, was set in a rooming house of a blind woman. And it's the last three days of civilization. And this set actually grew as, it's about nature taking over. So uh, flowers would pop up, little drops would come down. Uh, of, of, as characters disappeared and died, this thing came to life. There's the main character, Penny Plain. And um, I, I, I really like this one. And this chair, oddly enough, I designed the fabric for it. And the fabric artist at the Stratford Festival made the fabric and their head of props built that little chair. So, you know, if you give me a dime, I'll spend it. And there she is again, Penny Plain. And, you know, there's duplicates in the shows because in Penny Plain, there are four of her. In Street of Blood for Esme Mazengill, we see her at three ages in many different costumes. So I think there were... 13 marionettes representing Esme Mazengill. In Tinka's New Dress, there were seven of Tinka because she was in a different color palette. For So, it, you know, if I ever get my hands on the guy who writes all this stuff, I'm going to kill him, but it happens to be me. So I make a lot of work for myself when I come into the studio. This is the front curtain for the Daisy Theater, which is a two-hour improvised show with a cast of characters that really have nothing to do with each other. It's it's like a modern vaudeville. Uh, we have songs that are original to the show. Uh, there are three main characters who are represented on this drop. There's Edna Rural with her fork and Esme Mazengill, and of course Schnitzel, who is the most popular character I've ever made. There's the new Mrs. Edna Rural, uh, who has never missed a performance of the Daisy Theater. So I, I don't know how many we've done. That's Esme Mazengill, the current version. Um, there's the design sketch for Esme's uh, redemption gown. We have a show called 
Little Dickens, which is the Daisy Theater cast, improvises their way through Christmas Carol. And this is Esme Scrooge in her redemption gown at the end. Uh, a very popular act is Meyer Lemon and Little Woody. It's a ventriloquist marionette with a ventriloquist dummy marionette. Um, and the dummy does all the talking. Uh, and we have a little orchestra. We have a little band that rises up. Someone from the audience comes and cranks a handle and this little uh, band rises up and then they crank the other handle and they all play. And this is one of the acts, Rosemary Focaccia, who sings with the band. And there's Schnitzel, one of the Schnitzels. Uh, this is what I love about marionettes is playing with proportion. You know, in many books, they'll give you... Uh, well, for example, they'll give you a, a male pattern and a female pattern and a child pattern. And many people have used the same body patterns and just different heads over their careers. So I was taught to design like my mentor, Martin Stevens, in that blueprint from the beginning that every character is drawn front and profile. And so every character is a bespoke drawing and posture. So here you see Mrs. Bohobo, who's a very large puppet, and Schnitzel, who's a very small puppet. Uh, and I love playing with posture and weight and all of that stuff uh for a show uh called forget me not which was audience interactive uh we made 120 hand puppet heads we were going to make a few molds and cast them and then i decided to sculpt them all individually and i had an assistant jesse who for two and a half years paper mache these heads six layers of paper mache on each head then we would put gold leaf on them and and then we made 120 bodies with different costumes on all of them because the audience it was for 100 people maximum every night in a found space like a warehouse or somewhere and the audience in a ritual would be given their hand puppet and they became the others um that was a lot of work <laughs> this is a, a a shot from near the end of forget me not where I basically deconstruct. There's marionettes, there's hand puppets. Um, and at the end, there's just a miniature of the main character's head on my finger. And at the very end, there's no puppet on my hand at all. And I built a hand puppet show during lockdown. So here they are, kind of like the Daisy Theater, but I, I didn't know what the economy of the theater or when it was going to open would be or what my career would be. And I remembered being that 14 year old kid who had a little hand puppet stage that would fit into a car and I could set it up and, you know, uh, do the show. So I built the Looney bin, which is a hand puppet show I can set up in about half an hour. I run sound and lights and I made a, a, a cast of hand puppets, but we really spent the time exploring what hand puppets can do. And, um, you know, uh, by going in at this angle from the back, you get the hump built in and, so there's a lot of bespoke work on these things. And it's it was fun to build a hand puppet show again. And there's a scene from the little tiny stage with its little proscenium and its little paper mache moon. So in a weird way, I just went back to the beginning of, of making a small little show just for me. Thank you, Ronnie, so much. That was wonderful. Um, lots of insight in his... Everybody can see Ronnie sitting in his studio, um, which is a little bit, I think all of these folks all have their kind of Willy Wonka um, <laughs> space where they create. And, and um, I know Kevin's going to talk a little bit about that as well. So let me introduce um, Kevin Kidney. Um, Kevin is an accomplished author, illustrator, sculptor, theatrical director, and puppeteer. Um, for more than 20 years, uh, Kevin was an art director at the Walt Disney Company, designing live entertainment and collectible merchandise for the Disney parks worldwide. Today, Kevin is one half of Kevin and Jody Show, a unique studio in Southern California with artist uh, Jody Daly. In addition to theatrical work, uh, Kevin and Jody create stop motion puppets for film and television, movie props. Uh, museum exhibits, parade floats, hot air balloons, and everything from clothing to cocktail bars. Um, <laughs> right now, Kevin's working. I know he's going to probably talk about this, but Kevin is getting ready because the 
um, is he is leading efforts for the Anaheim Halloween Parade, which is celebrating its 100th anniversary this year. So they've been very busy um, building new floats and, and things for that parade. So, um, Kevin, I will bring up your slides. So, well, hey, I, I'm just so thrilled to be here. And I I, I like to think I love Ronnie's uh, description of his um, his imaginary family. And uh, I hope that uh, I'm also a, a cousin of all of you because uh, I feel such a kinship to all the things that you've been talking about. Um, this is me and my husband, Jody, and we have been artists uh, also working together for about 35 years-ish. Um, we met at Disney uh, in the art department, and this is uh, us. Uh, a few years ago, we had designed a parade for Disneyland that was based on uh, my paper sculpture work. And um, so all the floats had a paper sculpture uh, aesthetic to them. So you can go on to the next slide. Um, so here's our studio, and it doesn't actually have the words Kevin and Jody show stenciled on the outside. This is a publicity shot. I think our neighbors would flip out if we did that. Um, this is, uh, I you know, reading up on Tony Sarg's uh, studio, his uh, old curiosity shop studio. Um, I love to think this is our new curiosity shop. It's actually a, a building built in the 1920s, a historic building that was a complete dump when we got it. And uh, we overhauled it. And this is absolutely, this is 100% our studio, uh, which is um, the coolest thing ever to have your own studio space. Anybody who knows how that goes. So just like Tony Sarg, the uh, ground floor is a workshop, uh, just like the old curiosity shop was. Um, where I build um, all kinds of things from props. That's a prop from uh, a movie called Mary Poppins Returns, uh, the, the famous St. Paul's Cathedral Snow Globe scene in the movie. So I got to build that and some other things. You can move on to the next slide. This is upstairs. Um, it's This never looks like this. This was a day we had it all cleaned and swept out for a TV shoot. And I grabbed a camera and took a shot because I thought I'll never see it looking this nice <laughs> ever again. <laughs> There's boxes and fabric and, you know, all kinds of stuff laying all over the place. Exacto knife blades. You got to be very careful where you walk. <laughs> um, but this is my space, my personal space that I love so much. Um, I do a lot of sculpting here. Uh, puppet making, paper sculpture, um, miniatures, and, um, you know, all of my work is here, which I love. Uh, so as I said, I, I kind of got my start uh, as a paper sculptor. Um, it was all because I was studying theater in high school and I had no money. And uh, I learned that I could make all my miniature sets out of paper by scoring everything and bending walls and making staircases and everything. And, uh, and if I didn't like it, I could just throw it away and it cost me nothing. So uh, it was a, a great skill to learn really early on. And then I've used that skill as an illustrator. Uh, these are some different pieces of art that you see on the right, uh, done for magazines and such. So really enjoy doing that. Okay, so just like Ronnie, I'm so glad you showed that picture of you, uh, Ronnie, as a kid. I was like, oh, I have the same, I have the same uh, similar life here. Okay, so this is my puppet theater. This is me at 17 years old. Uh, my little brother had a camera and took my picture. It was kind of a very homemade situation, but uh, all of my, uh, as you can see, I, my puppets at the time were very influenced by Henson. Um, they were all hand puppets and rod puppets, um, all cut out of blocks of mattress foam and scraps of fake fur and you know cut apart bleach bottles and everything but the thing that i really enjoyed the most about making puppets was um doing tricks with them and getting the faces to um to animate eyes to move around and it was kind of a mystery to me to figure this out um i got to spend a summer in the 1980s uh uh, working, not working, but just sort of volunteering, sitting in, I'd say, uh, with a puppet show at Casa Bonita restaurant, uh, famous Casa Bonita. And uh, I got to sit back in the puppet theater with the puppeteer there and, uh, you know, watching how the roll drops worked and everything. I was just so fascinated. I learned a lot that uh, that summer. But um, yeah, my, my first, um, I'd say, uh, what do you say? Introduction to Tony Sarg was also Bill Baird's uh, book as well. 
Okay, so I my puppets got me hired at Disney. Um, I took one of them with me and I got hired on the spot just because I had a puppet that could blink its eyes and, <laughs> and they were like, oh yeah, we could use that skill. <laughs> and so my very first job was actually getting sent to New York um, like right away, months after getting hired, I'm in New York and this is, I'm actually crammed inside of a Bloomingdale's store window here, uh, because right there, I guess it's what Lexington Avenue, um, we had Christmas windows that Disney had, um, sent out from California and they were all marionettes. Everything was built by the Bob Baker studios here in Los Angeles. And, um, they were, you know, from the 60s and 70s, and here we are in the 80s, so things were breaking. They had nylon strings and threads that made, with little motors up in the roof that turned, that made them dance and do things. So you can go to the next slide and you can see what the finished window looked like. There it is, I stepped out on the street. But it was kind of fun being in there because uh, right, we were behind the glass setting up these things with, uh, you know, passersby going by on the street. And <laughs> it was just such a surreal experience. And I like I'm barely 20, you know. Um, okay, so this is cool. I I the this is just weird, but um my first big design job at Disney was designing giant balloons, character balloons. And um, so I was fascinated watching the uh, Macy's uh, segment that you had on early earlier. Um, the character balloons were about 30, 35 feet tall. And instead of being the floating free, free kind on, on ropes, um, these were actually on bases that rolled down the street. And uh, instead of the complex cables inside, we um, because Disney, the Disney parks have such narrow streets, you don't want a balloon to lose its, uh, you know, its air and just start fainting over onto a building or onto a crowd of people, which is just a narrow little hallway of a, of a parade route. So we had these telescoping um, uh, columns inside the balloons that would kind of rise up and then we would pump all the air into them, but they still had a very nice uh, animation to them as they went. They were just so towering and top heavy that, you know, they naturally looked like they were kind of sauntering down the street with this, uh, with this fun movement. Um, but uh, the balloons, I have to tell you, they led on to the whole thing. Uh, we actually did a a, 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 a Muppet parade. Uh, this was in 1990. Jim Henson was still alive and um, Disney had an agreement to do a Muppet parade and they were all going to be balloons. Um, and then, of course, he passed away and all of our designs got sent over to the Muppets. They they took all of our maquettes and statues and everything. So I've never seen them, uh, you know, in decades. I don't know. But anyway, this is a photo of me working on a, a very popular show that's still in the Disney parks today called Fantasmic. Uh, it's a river show, nighttime show. I was one of the art directors on that um, with uh, Tom Butch here and designed the big puppets that are on the show and they're big balloons. So they're balloons and puppets all at the same time. Um, this is just one slide to represent an entire huge part of my, uh, you know, 30 year career, which was doing merchandise and miniature um, models for Disney. Um, we did it, Jody and I still continue to do this to this day, uh, making merchandise. And our favorite is to do uh, small replicas of um, ride vehicles and architectural pieces and stuff. So love doing that. But that slide gets that entire thing out of the way. <laughs> Um, but I love making things uh, by hand. This is a one of a kind. This is this is all gray auto body primer on top of wood. So it's all wood carved and everything. And I have such a blast um, still to this day, even in this computer world, uh, making things by hand. That's just absolutely the most joy I get. So our next slide is, oh, so we've also done some, uh, the puppet sort of led to doing some figure finishing for on animatronics. Um, I got to work on one of the first animatronic uh, characters for a parade float at Disney, which was for the Lion King parade. Actually, it was a hornbill named Zazu. Uh, but this is a, a little parrot from, uh, from Walt Disney World to finish him. And if you go to the next slide, you'll see how he turned out. There he is, really cool. But this is all made entirely by scratch, um, you know, all painted and a little wood uh, peg leg there and the hand sewn hat and everything. But Jody and I do all of this in our studio. Uh, if you go to the next slide, I think it's the Hatbox Ghost. This was a commission for Guillermo del Toro, uh, director who was at the time working on a movie for Disney based on Haunted Mansion. Of course, the a movie did happen without Guillermo. 
but uh, it was a lot of fun to build this uh, character, which he now has in his home uh, behind a hidden uh, bookcase that slides out of the way and you go into a, a hidden secret room and, uh, and this awful character is there standing between the bookcases. Um, okay, so one parade float. This is just one I thought I would show you. Um, Jody and I together and separately have probably worked on maybe 15, 16 different parades uh, for the Disney parks worldwide. Uh, and this was just one I wanted to show you because uh, it was also based on paper sculpture and such. And oh yeah, so these are some models for that parade um, uh, using my paper sculpting techniques to create uh, characters and pieces and and uh, big large puppets that would be on the on the float. So they just copied everything, you know, um, when they the fabrication team built uh, these characters, they were all made out of metal and plastics and kydex and uh, different fabrics and stuff. Um, Kevin, can I ask you for this, like this character, for example, do you first sketch it and then do you create a, a, a like a blueprint for all of the paper pieces? How does that? Well, we kind of did it backwards because um, usually you would draw everything. I think Jody had concepted, this is a fox hunter from Mary Poppins. And he's in this weird position because he's riding a, a penny farthing bicycle, one of those old fashioned big wheel bikes. And he uh, actually has a pedaling action. He's very tall. This character was, oh, I want to say probably, you know, maybe 20 feet tall. And he had a little uh, uh, wiggly puppet fox up in his hat and he pedaled down the street. But we had the concept and then I just working from the concept, I designed the character as we went. It was just, I'm just gonna grab some paper and start playing around with it and move the eyes around. And, you know, it's kind of based on an animated character from, from the film Mary Poppins. So I had that to look at, but then I wanted to give it a different twist and a different style and, and make him very um, geometric so that there was no, uh, question that he was, uh, you know, designy to built built in the in the the theme of the rest of the parade. Um, these are just a couple more. I just thought I'd show because I was really proud of these. Um, the little penguin there, as you can see, he's a paper sculpture. I, actually, he's made out of plastics, polystyrene plastics, but uh, he's all jointed so that he can dance and kind of do a little jig. And we had a had uh, all these little puppets uh, rigged up to to uh, motors that would wiggle them so that they would do their do their little act, which was a lot of fun. Okay, so I've gotten to do, I just love uh, paper. It's, I still enjoy doing it. And th this is a little puppet I did for an animated series uh, for Scholastic Books and um, which uh, was online a few years ago. Uh, telling some stories and promoting uh, reading for kids. If you go to the next slide, you can see a, a, a little film frame, like what the characters look like and everything. But it, you know, it's typical stop motion animation and the characters are jointed uh, with thread and uh, sticky tack and all kinds of stuff hidden behind the scenes that you can't see. And then just manipulated frame by frame uh, to, uh, to, to move. Um, I also do all the sets, and I loved, this was a really fun one, um, a little scene, and everything was here also animated, the windmill, of course, turned, the little flags all waved and everything. If you go to the next slide, you can see that it's set up uh, just at, on the uh, camera stand there for animation. And I, yes, okay, it, this was uh, just, uh, just some more paper sculpture uh, sets scenes I've designed over the years. Let's see what the next one is. Oh, so, uh, and then stop motion animation. I love doing puppets that are uh, dimensional as well with, um, you know, your typical steel uh, armature inside and uh, that are poseable and things. This was something, I don't know if you all know who Charles Phoenix is, but he's pretty well known out here in California uh, on television and radio all the time talking about fun things around Southern California. So this was a little uh, animated piece for his Christmas show at the Walt Disney um, Concert Hall several years ago. Um, this is a puppet that uh, I designed for a, a new upcoming documentary on Don the Beachcomber. Uh, if, you, if you know Don, he created 
very famous line of restaurants and created cocktails and stuff like that. So this is a little stop motion puppet of him uh, that will be matched to married to real recordings of Don uh, when he was older. Uh, we just have we had recordings without um, without any film that went with it. So we decided we would just animate to the to his actual voice. And I think in the next shot, you can see um, his little puppet head getting sculpted here. This is just, it's just Sculpey uh, over wood and wire and, um, you know, and then his little um, facial features are, are paper, actually. His mouth and pupils and everything are paper that are uh, animated and move around on his face. And this is my last slide. Uh, I didn't want to bring too much. Uh, this is my most recent, uh, project I'm working on for a, a, a magazine called Monolith. Uh, they're doing a whole feature on a film that was um, directed by George Powell back in the um, 1960s called The Seven Faces of Dr. Lowe. Uh, Tony Randall played all the characters in this creepy circus that um, is so magical and the people in the town that see it are so um, uh, what is it? They're so skeptical. They don't believe magic even when they see it right in front of their faces. It's It's got a neat uh, story. <laughs> uh, so anyway, I did all the characters uh, out of wood and Sculpey, and they're all just puppets, uh, like stop motion style puppets that uh, we're uh, photographing for still frames. So that is all the pictures that I brought <laughs> to show you guys. But uh, if wow. I... Yeah, I didn't know what to. I didn't know what to. I I I wish I had seen this entire symposium before I sent you photos. <laughs> I'd be like, oh yeah, this is this is great. Well, thank you guys. Um, unfortunately, we're right at time where we have to wrap up. But I know that I know that uh, Stephanie wants to say a few words um, since we're at the end of the symposium. But thank you so much to the three of you. Um, it's so exciting to just see the range of creativity. Um, craft so very inspiring what an, what an exceptional session thank you so much and we'd love to talk with all of you all day to hear what it's really like to be a professional puppeteer uh, but I do want to hold this book up this is Carl's book and you all referred to it it's uh, the Bill Baird um, Art of Puppetry book and that's <laughs> <laughs> great it's Carl, a good book. back to you um, but Thank you all so much for an exceptional day. I'd like to thank Darren for his uh, partnership in this program and the exhibition itself, and all of our amazing uh, speakers who have shared so much um, that have shed light on this incredible subject. And um, we hope to welcome some of you to the Norman Rockwell Museum before November 5th, but if you don't make it and can uh, see the show out on Nantucket, uh, that'll be next summer. Thank you again for a great day, and uh, we'll hope to see you again soon.